Sounds good. Okay. All right. I think we're set to go. So uh, let's right. let's just have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with Joy Kaufman and to learn more about Farm Stew and uh, the wonderful things that they are doing in various parts of Africa. And we just ask that you guide our discussion, Lord, and that it be profitable and that you will be honored and glorified as a result of our discussion today. We thank you for being with us and being in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is, this is an assignment for a class called Integrated Community Development. And um, I thought that Farm okay. stew would be a perfect, um, you know, little specimen to use uh, because I, as I looked at your program, as I've heard about your program, Joy, um, I see that that is exactly what you're doing. You're, you're in communities and you are doing, you know, community development. And uh, so I'm impressed with what you're doing. So let me just uh, introduce you first. Uh, I'm talking today with Joy Kaufman, who is the uh, director, uh, president, uh, head person, <laughs> in chief of uh, the, the founder. <laughs> I don't remember exactly what your title is, but uh, Joy Kaufman um, actually is the, yeah. the brain behind uh, Farm Stew. And we're going to talk a little bit more today about what. Um, work they are doing in, in some of the communities in Africa. So my, my first question to you, Joy, is um, in a nutshell, tell us what the mission of Farm Stew is. Well, it's a privilege to be here with you, Pat, and also just to get to meet the people through the new university that I'm just learning about uh, that where you're studying. and. The mission of Farm Stew is to improve the health and well-being of poor families and vulnerable people by sharing the recipe of abundant life around the world. And what we call the recipe of abundant life is kind of a, a take off of the eight laws of health that some speak about in Ellen White's writing. It's actually, we feel that she's very holistic and very comprehensive and actually would see the world through the lens of public health if, if she if that field was around <laughs> in her time and so the the eight ingredients in the recipe for abundant life that we feel make up this recipe as farming attitude rest and meals sanitation temperance enterprise and water so some of those ingredients you've heard of in other health messages but each of them have a particular spin on them that are really geared toward poor and families and vulnerable people, particularly in the developing world. Wow, okay. So attitude is one that's just slightly different than some of the other um, acronyms that I'm familiar with, like most art. So tell us a little bit uh, about what that one entails. Yeah, so one of our areas of focus is work, a work ethic. So we know as Sabbath keepers, we believe in rest. But the commandment also includes six days you labor and work. So part of our attitude is just really changing the mentality of work, especially farming work, mm. to say that this is an honorable profession given by God and that we're expected to do our work diligently. Another part of attitude is forgiveness. Uh, we work in areas where there's, like in South Sudan, where there's been just tribal conflict that has led to just generational violence and wars. Um, so really the forgiveness, also the gratitude um, and the empowerment that comes with being grateful rather than you know, counting the things that are going against you versus counting your blessings, naming one by mm -hmm. one. You know? um, and then I'd say the last really important feature of attitude is also like a sense of connectedness, um, both with God and also with other people. So mm -hmm. there's been a lot of research on longevity that talks about our relationships are actually key to our longevity. Mm -hmm. So encouraging connectedness, whether it's church attendance or involved in a, a social civic club, something that 
keeps a family thinking outside of themselves. Wow, I love it. I love it. That is excellent. So what inspired you to start this program? Well, I give all credit to God. I mean, I actually thought of the acronym one day. I was, it was the Sabbath afternoon and I was studying the Adventist message, but I hadn't fully, you know, been baptized yet. And one of the things that I was excited about being a public health nutritionist and being a vegetarian since a young age and being very interested in the intrigue of the blue zones, you know, how are Adventists mm -hmm. living seven to 10 years longer than other people, but then recognizing that God is not a God of disparities. God loves his children, each and every one with the same love. Jesus died for each and every one of us with the same blood. And so this idea that North American Adventists are living till the age of like 90, and then you have countries all over the world where the, health, the life expectancy is like 50. So that's just not right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So looking at our health messages and realizing that there was a level of affluence um, required, like, for example, just exercise. Exercise is great, you know, um, but when you're saying go out and get fresh air, sunshine and exercise, you're not speaking to a group of people who are subsistence farmers already walking half a mile or a mile or more to go get water every day, right? There, that's three ingredients in the recipe that is, they can take for granted, but they can't take for granted that they can even feed their families or that they're going to have clean water when they get to the well. Um, so things like that, I just felt like there has to be some relevancy for the close to a billion people in the world who are living on less than $2 a day. Wow. There has to be a health message for them too. Yeah. So you've taken it really and tailored uh, the program to meet the needs of the people, to meet them where they are, which is what we are told to do. And what a, what, what a wonderful way to take your skills. Uh, you have a master's in public health and what a wonderful way to take those skills and use them for um, the benefit and blessing of other people, not for yourself or not to make, you know, uh, tons of money. Although, you know, most of us even in that field, most people in that field don't make a lot of money, but they do it for because they have a passion. But you have gone even a step further and you're doing this as a as a mission and a ministry and that is that is commendable. So um who is your uh, and I'll just say to that that I I really believe that the Seventh day Adventist Church is God's vehicle for public health really Amen. because yeah. we are everywhere there's nine million seventh-day adventists in sub-saharan africa with a growth rate of seven percent annually so there's no other organization that is better situated to be able yes. to reach the poorest of the poor and to transform their lives especially yes. on that continent but all around the world too yeah so it's it's a win-win really and that's what I'm excited about is I can't do anything on my own. You know, I tried in my twenties yeah. to go save the world and went on my <laughs> mission trips and all this stuff. But when I went home, that was it. It ended. But with the partnership with the church, it's like you can plant a seed and there will be someone to water it. There will be someone to make it grow. And God is making this grow. So yes. that's what's so fun for me. Yes, that that is wonderful. Yeah, what a perfect partnership, as you said, um, because the church has the, you know, the message and the and the means, and so what a what a perfect um, partnership to be able to uh, reach people through the health message. And uh, so we are we are blessed. Yeah. yeah, I can resonate with that. So, who exactly is your target population? Well, we've started in Sub-Saharan Africa because one in three children there are severely malnourished to the extent that they are stunted in their growth, meaning there are two standard deviations off of a height for age scale. And so we feel like that level of malnutrition has lifelong implications that are totally preventable, but irreversible. So we feel like if we can reach the least of these, the little ones, you know, with what they need, we could change the future of the continent. Okay. Um, we actually have recently launched in Cuba as well. And so that's kind of a stretch outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. But we know that the, the people there are really suffering pretty extreme poverty, especially 
got to open the door there and it was before COVID. Now things are getting really, really difficult there. And I know in so many places in the world, it's very difficult. So we started in Sub-Saharan Africa, but we also now have a web-based platform where our curriculum mm -hmm. is online. Mm -hmm. um, you can just go to our website, farmstudy.org, click on the recipe and go to e-learning and anybody in the world can take the class from anywhere in the world. Wow. We now have a website translated into Spanish, Arabic, Swahili, and French. Wow. So wow. we're trying to just reach out as far as we can. So yeah, <laughs> so wow. it's a big, big audience that we're going for. And I think we just signed a memorandum of understanding with Adventist World Radio. Mm. And so we're really excited about being able to get our content out on the thousand plus radio stations they personally, like they own. And then also all of the ones that they use to carry programming. So that's another new exciting thing that will reach our audience a lot further than we can physically wow. go. Wow. So it sounds like there's a lot of growth and expansion. And it also sounds like, you know, as in many other situations, the, the limitations of the pandemic have actually opened up new and different opportunities and actually expanded the potential for, for ministry. It sounds like that, uh, that's exactly what's happened. With we really well. prayed and just was like, okay, God, what do you want us to do? You know, how are you going to give us wings to fly during this time that we can't fly physically right. anywhere? Yeah. And we really feel like he's, he's done that. Mm -hmm. So we pray yes. God for that. What a blessing. So um, tell me a little more about the specific activities. I know you've mentioned a few things that, that you are doing, um, you know, trying to prevent and reverse child stunting. Um, mm -hmm. what are, tell us about some of the other things that, that you're doing through Farms too. Okay, I was gonna reach up and find it, but I, <laughs> I'm not sure if I can. Oh, actually I can, yay. So I'm gonna share with you, hopefully, oh, there's a bad glare, but it's our mm -hmm. five freedom priorities. Uh -huh. So this is our Farms Two Falls freedom priorities. And we're excited, the five priorities that we have worked on to, to really develop in our strategic plan is the first is the freedom from dependency. Mm. So that's helping people learn to grow their own food and also grow their own small businesses and have cleanliness, you know, next to godliness in terms of um, mm. just the hygiene and everything that will keep their families sick and out of the hospital, which also creates a cycle of dependency. So that's the first freedom. The second freedom is the freedom from shame which is our initiative to help girls get menstrual hygiene uh, supplies and menstrual hygiene education that will help them stay in school and create the possibilities of the next generation also being more well-fed and well-educated because a woman's uh, education directly correlates to the health of her future family. Mm. And then the third priority In water to places where we mm. there's not currently access to clean water we went into that field a little bit slowly because a it costs a lot of money and b there are a lot of other organizations doing water but what we realized is that money we just have to trust god to bring it and yes there's other organizations doing water but not necessarily in a community development way in the communities where we're working. Mm. So we only bring wells in places where um, through the freedom from dependency work, the families have become certified farms do families. Mm. Um, and they have, there's been an 80% majority of that family groups in a community that have become certified. So it becomes a certified farms do community. And at that point, we'll consider putting a well into the community because we know that they'll have a farm stew committee that will maintain the well and actually buy pump insurance. And so we want to do it in like, not just a one-off, you know, go drill right. something and then it's going to be broken six months later. Yeah. So uh, I'll go more into the communities and homes and everything later, but the fourth priority is the freedom to share globally. So that's looking at the power of the curriculum that we have written and we want to share it like on this e-learning platform and then also get it into the hands of other organizations like AWR. 
so that they can share this information that we know can save lives, not only physically, but also eternally, because everything is Bible-based and everything is pointing to Jesus's desire for us to have abundant life here and now and forever. And then the last priority is the freedom to grow. And that's kind of our, our priority that just gives us the options to dream, some big dreams. So one of those dreams we're working on right now is Farm Stew Foods, which would be a sustainable food company that would create whole food, plant-based, nutrient-dense products in Africa by Africans for Africans, but where they would be generating profits from Farm Stew Foods that would go to support trainers being able to be deployed wherever the factories were constructed. So we're kind of excited about that in terms of a growth model that would make us a self-supporting ministry. Excellent. Excellent. So um, in terms of community involvement um, and having the people themselves, uh, one of the things I've learned in this class so far is that um, we like to have more of a grassroots approach rather than a top-down approach and to make a program you know more successful it's ideal to get the involvement and buy-in and participation not just participation but also you know involving the community that you're trying to serve in uh, planning and directing and um, choosing the direction in which they go so how has farms to involve the people that you're helping in actually you know planning and implementing your uh, projects well i would say that's one of the things i'm most proud of about firms too is that it's not about me <laughs> like mm -hmm. i am the founder but um farms too actually began i was over there on a three-week usaid farmer to farmer volunteer program i had no intention whatsoever of starting an organization <laughs> and no idea whatsoever of what God had called me to. And I met local people and the whole thing started because I realized that the training that I was doing, which was hands-on cooking classes, focused on soy protein that the kids were sorely lacking and getting it into their mouths. Um, I realized that there was just a total buzz created in the community when we'd go out and do these classes, mm -hmm. but that there was absolutely no reason it needed to be coming through my lips and translated and everything like that. That the, the guys that I was working with, one was a volunteer from the church that had met me and just said, can I volunteer and go with you? And then the other was an, a local agronomist, a Ugandan agronomist. And I realized that the less I talked and the more I just let them talk locally in their language and everything, the people got even more animated and involved. They were great facilitators mm -hmm. and so I had to go home, like, you know, it was just a three week adventure. And God just told me to hire the local people. So most of the recipes, most of the, like a lot of the curriculum even was just their design, mm. their ideas. Um, for example, they started making tofu. They call it soy scrambled eggs. And honestly, I didn't even know what they were making <laughs> for like about six months. I thought somehow they figured out how to make eggs out of this soy mug. I don't even know what they're doing. But I figured out later, oh yeah, somehow they just, they squeeze lemons and add a little bit of salt to the milk and just right out there in the villages, they're curdling it and mm. it's tofu. So anyway, like that's been really fun. They have been leading it. They've been managing it. And even during this pandemic, I mean, I actually am kind of grieving because I was trying to figure out how to get myself over there. And I just realized it's just not wise, but they've been running this show and they've been doing a great job and they got audited recently. We decided we would go ahead and have all three farms to international farms to South Sudan and farms to Uganda audited. So it's local involvement, but then there is that accountability and oversight, which is so important too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's their program, and um, you're just kind of, uh, you know, guiding, and uh, they are really integrally involved, and they own the program, it sounds like, from what you're saying. 
So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll just say when we first had the opportunity to go on 3ABN, this was a couple of years ago, it was so funny because they go and they check with the Uganda Union and the ECD. And it was so funny because they called up Edward, who's our country director, and I call him the founder of Farms to Uganda. And they, um, they were asking him questions and then they said, oh, we want to talk with Joy. And he's like, well, Joy's not here. <laughs> and they're like, well, where's Joy? And she's like, Joy's in America. <laughs> and they were shocked that he was running it. Yeah. And she's like, he's like, uh, no, I've been running it since like day one. <laughs> right. So, we just have a good laugh about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. That's beautiful. Okay. So um, what kind of collaborating are you doing with other agencies, um, community agencies, you know, either governmental or non-governmental programs? Are you working yeah. in concert with any? Yeah. So we actually have several and I'll just name three that I think are the most important uh, one is with AfroPads, which is a self, a, a sustainable uh, industry that's in Uganda. So all of the menstrual hygiene supplies we buy, they are in Uganda, made by Ugandans. And it's a company, it actually has some roots in the Netherlands and Canada, but they've been helping girls and women with uh, those types of supplies. And so we've collaborated with them on a number of different things, including most recently getting pads and uh, panties and everything for 700 refugee women. So that's been a neat partnership. Also with water, we realized we didn't want to bring in our own big rig and like just, you know, people that were on vacation and go around and just drill these wells. We wanted to hire a local company that would do the work. And so we partnered with a group called Freedom Drillers out of Uganda but they actually have support from an organization called Water 4, the number four, uh, that's in uh, Oklahoma. So our water work is half funded by Water 4, which is really nice. And they had the technical expertise in wells that we didn't have and we knew we couldn't get quickly. So that's been a neat partnership. And then finally, Makarere University is uh, the top university in Uganda, and it's actually quite high ranked in Africa. We've done some research projects with them, uh, looking at maize and how to improve the quality of maize for people. And we're actually looking, we got a publication <laughs> out of the work, which was pretty exciting. And we are hoping to have them do an external evaluation of our programs. We did get an external evaluation actually in South Sudan by another organization but I'm most excited about this one from Makarere just because of the respect that they have throughout the African region. So that's just to name a few. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So yes, that sounds like you're collaborating well with others. And of course this, you know, that's, um, you know, we can't all do it all. We can't, none of us can do it all. None of us knows it all. So it's wonderful when we can collaborate with others exactly. that yeah, make an even greater impact. And so speaking of impact, I'm gonna, gonna combine my next two questions, which um, have to do with the impact that you see this program having on the community and also in terms of health behaviors, what um, changes are you seeing taking place in um, both individuals and the community as a result yeah, so I really love the whole science of health behavior change. I actually went to Hopkins and they have the, uh, a school for behavior change in the public health department. And I, to me, that's kind of like the holy grail of, of public health, you know, because you can have the head knowledge, you can have the, the, okay, I feel that something should be, but unless it actually goes into the hands, you know, the head, the heart, the hands unless it goes into what your actions are, behavior change doesn't matter. So, you know, you might know you need to exercise and you might really believe that you oughta, shoulda, coulda, woulda exercise, but unless you go out and actually exercise it, none of that intention matters. So I really believe, and I, would, I, I continue to make a case for the fact that the Bible is actually the best way 
to move ideas conceptually from the head to the heart to the hands because it's it's there's something about the word of god that is powerful and effective and and can change and transform lives and so that's what i feel like is really key to the success of farm stew is that we are motivating people in the way that god motivates people that it's not only is everything um, based in the word of God so people know that it's not just some, you know, random white lady that shows up and tells them what to do. It's not just some, you know, new campaign that bought a bunch of billboards in Kampala that's telling you what to do. It's not even just, you know, these fellow Ugandans that are just showing up in their community telling you what to do. We say, okay, here we are for class and let's open the word of God. Let's start in Genesis. You know, let's see what are what did God tell us to eat? You know, Genesis 129, we call that God's dietary guidelines. You know, he told us to eat seeds. And what are seeds? Okay, seeds are whole grains. Seeds are legumes. Seeds are nuts. You know, he told us to eat fruit. Well, in a lot of these African countries, they actually don't think of fruit as actual food. It's something more that the kids just run around and climb trees and they eat the fruit. But it's not really an adult thing to do. Um, the adult thing to do is you fill the belly with corn <laughs> and you feel full. That's, that's the satisfaction that they're looking for is just that feeling of like, I'm stuffed. And so you can get that by stuffing yourself full of corn or cassava or white rice or white bread. But all of those things are not going to enrich the blood. So when we go to the word of God and we say, okay, in Genesis 3, God tells us to eat that which is pleasing to the eye. What is pleasing to the eye? Color. What is a rainbow? You know, so talking about your plate being a rainbow. So that's like using the Bible to promote dietary diversity and uh, just a, a, a improved nutrition. I don't think we could make that type of behavior change were we not able to use the Bible to defend this is what God, your creator, wants you to do. And so what I've seen is just people really saying, okay, this is what God who loves me and wants me to have abundant life tells me to do and how it's to live. So they're doing it. Like people that maybe were lethargic around farming or are just, you know, not putting the full effort in when they see God telling them to farm, to tend and keep their land, you know, there's just this higher bar put up there. And so We've seen, even during this time of pandemic, one thing I'm so excited about, and I get so many stories that I don't even process them and tell them, and I need to even make more videos like this, but they, um, the refugee rations were cut by one third as of April 1st. And I mean, these were small rations already, but we have refugees looking for market and actually our agronomists finding market for them for their soybeans that they're growing because they're growing in abundance at a time of scarcity. And we have stories like that all over where we've been working. And one of the things I'm really excited about, and I can share with you um, uh, part of our newsletter, is that we did an independent research in South Sudan, and we showed that the mid-upper arm circumference of the children, I, I don't know if you are familiar with that as a measurement yes. of malnutrition, but between six months and five years, it's a very effective tool, just a little band that shows, actually I keep one at my desk, I call it the nutritionist stethoscope. Yes. So we were able to go from, I believe it was 41% of the children in this range of yellow to red, meaning that their little arms were so small that mm. they could um, fit in this little stethoscope. Like that's red, mm. it's so tiny. And this is yellow. So, so, so tiny. And so we were able to go from 41% of the kids being in that category down to three. And those three were in the yellow, not the red. And so that's a huge change in terms of just saving lives and, and helping also the families know that each kid is precious. Each kid is a child of God and they are worthy of working hard to be able to feed them. So wow. that's, that's what we're seeing. And a lot of people taking a lot of initiative and enterprise too, just figuring out what they can do to sell something, to make something just creative, you know, a, 
the hand washing stations that we've been promoting now with COVID people really get it and how important it mm. is. And they actually, um, one guy actually started making mobile tippy taps <laughs> because his got stolen. So he started selling these little tippy taps that were on a stand that could be taken in at night and not get stolen at night. So tell us what a tippy tap. Like tell us what a describe what a tippy tap is. Oh sure, a tippy tap is a um. Sorry, my headset keeps falling out. Um, so a tippy tap is a hand washing station, and um, it's basically how to bring running water into a community where there isn't any such thing. And so it's just a can, like a, a container that's on a stick and you have a string coming down that has a lever at the bottom. And so people put their foot on the lever and it tips over the can and the water comes out. So it's a way of hand washing. Mm. Mm. And we promote people using um, soap, of course, with hand washing, but most of the people we work with can't afford soap. And what we've learned is that wood ash is highly alkaline. It's actually what was used to make lye soap, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, scrubbing with ash is equally effective for cleanliness. Mm -hmm. So that's something else, just a simple, what they, can they afford? What can they actually do that will help their health and well-being? So mm -hmm. we've seen a huge improvement in hand washing. Wonderful. It must be really gratifying to be able to see that what you're doing is making a difference and you can see changes, you can see people implementing uh, the things that you're, you're teaching, they're putting them into practice and that must be uh, very gratifying. And also, I, I, I love the fact that you mentioned that, that the Bible is the foundation and um, this is, there. what better foundation can we base a program on than, uh, than the Bible? Because the Bible, of course, the principles in the Bible are life-changing. And, um, you know, it has the power, the power to change us. And so what better, there is no better uh, foundation on which to, to base your, your program. So that is excellent. Amen. So, so I just have a couple more questions. Actually, I think you've um, addressed uh, one of them, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to um, add anything to that. You talked a little bit about sustainability in terms of um, the water, um, you know, and um, also in terms of food. And uh, are there any other specific ways in which you are addressing sustainability um, of the program and, and, you know, not being, well, it's obvious that your program is not a hit and run program. Um, the people are actually, you know, they're owning it and they're doing it and they're running it, you know, and here you are over in the United States and, and they're running with it. But is there any other area yeah. in which sustainability is something that you're addressing? Yeah, so I think the biggest piece of sustainability that we really focus on is the transformation in the communities by using the motivating and inspiring volunteers. So in every community, each one of our trainers is responsible for raising up farm food volunteers in that community. And they are doing the house to house work. And that house to house work involves setting up a, a criteria where a home becomes a certified home if they have a productive garden producing three or more vegetables, they need to have a latrine, they need to have a tippy tap, they need to have the children with the proper MUAC scores like we talked about. And there's one more, I'm trying to remember, a rubbish pit. So they need to have a place to deposit their trash. Mm -hmm. So those are the five required elements. Mm -hmm. And then we have several other optional elements, one being like not producing alcohol, another being a compost pile, another being that they're part of a village savings and loan or selling something, some kind of business. And then finally involved in a weekly club of some sort, whether it's faith-based, we don't want to impose and say you have to go to church to be certified right. farms too, but we encourage that. So with this certification, if a family gets all five of the required and then two of the four optional things, they get a certificate and there, it's actually been really amazing because 
that certificate, it might be the only certificate that family has ever gotten. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we laminate them and we make them really nice and they're very excited about them. And those are renewable uh, mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. If they have it for three years, then we consider them fully, solely certified. And then what happens is it's kind of like the woman at the well that meet, met Jesus who goes and tells her village, like other people in the area, they want it too. And so that's where we go for trying to get the certified communities. And those communities then, they're eligible for other things like the wells we mentioned. Also, we have a solar dryer that we can make portable that we can bring out and help them dry some of their food. We just bought threshers, which sounds like, you know, every American farmer has a thresher, but basically nobody where we're working has a thresher mm. that can help them with the labor and uh, that'll help us actually get a small percentage of the crop so that we can use that for training classes and starting a health food store in Uganda. Mm. So there's just a lot of things that we're trying to do to build in um, that long-term sort of business model into what we're doing and also just the volunteerism in the local communities. Oh, wonderful. This sounds so exciting. Um, wonderful work that you're doing. Um, so as we wrap up here in the next couple of minutes, um, one of my other questions, and I think you addressed that one as well, has to do with um, the, the spiritual aspect, and you talked about that. And I think one last thing perhaps you could address, and anything else that you feel would be important to share, but what, what makes... Um, Farms do unique from any of the other programs in the areas where you're working? Well, I think our uniqueness is in a few areas. One is just that total local ownership of the message and of, of the organization. Invest in people. We don't have a big compound. We invest in people going out where the people are. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other uniqueness really is the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and how they have really shaped this curriculum. And what's very exciting to me is that there's one Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, I was a brand new Adventist. I actually was baptized a month after coming home from Uganda the first time after mm -hmm. we started this organization. And so I knew a lot of the writings of Sister Wright, but there was white, but there was a lot that I didn't know. And what amazes me is that I feel like what the Holy Spirit revealed to me and to us as an organization is it just keeps getting reaffirmed. The more mm -hmm. I read Spirit of Prophecy, the more I realize that we're on target. And you know, there are times I've made adjustments based on what I've read, but I really feel like the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding this whole thing. Wow. And I just feel like this is a message for now for the end time church, because this is something that all of us, even in North America, you know, facing food security issues, you know, during the pandemic, when the shelves were empty and people were like, wow, like I might actually need to start a garden. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, so it's, it's an important message for the whole world, but in particular, we know that Jesus, when he, unrolled the scroll of Isaiah and he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me because and I've come to bring good news to the poor if our health message is not good news to the poor it's not Jesus's message mm -hmm. so I think that's what I feel like this is fitting a need that the church has on a global scale and and I'm just so excited to be able to be a, a conduit for his blessings and his message out to the world and we have an amazing board. We have a lot of volunteers here in the U.S. and and our very small staff here in the U.S., but everyone just working hard and diligently getting this message out and trying to do it at a very, very high level that, you know, God would be proud of. <laughs> and we just want to do things that would give him glory, honor, and praise. So yes. I think he's blessing and That's our prayers just to stay in the center of his good and perfect will so that we can continue to, to be his tools. Yes, so that's our prayer. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Well, I will certainly be keeping Farm Stew in prayer and whatever I can do to help or to publicize and let people know about this wonderful work that you're doing. Um, I, I will be happy to do it. I, I just 
really admire you, Joy, for what you're doing and um, just, you know, praise the Lord. <laughs> it's God. Amen. It's, and thank you for allowing God to, to use you. Okay. Well, if well, there's... thank you for your role in, in ASI. It's been fun getting to know you. And, oh, yeah. And us, you know, introducing us to ASI Southwest, too. So yes. that's been a blessing. Yes. So yes, awesome. Yes, all right well um well thanks pat and god bless you okay thank you and have a great day and i'm sure we'll be in touch soon thanks again sounds good all right, all right. take okay. care you too bye-bye bye-bye